Welcome everyone to this session, Consensus Building and Measuring and Disclosing Impact. I'm Monique Aiken, Managing Director for TIP, the Investment Integration Project, a consulting services and applied research firm that provides advice, thought leadership, and a turnkey solution to help investors manage systemic risks and opportunities. I'm also a contributing editor at Impact Alpha, where I also host The Reconstruction, a podcast about moving capital towards justice. I'm also a co-founder of Make Justice Normal, a collective that seeks to open space for people that are working towards a world with cap in which capital embodies justice with the ultimate goal of narrative change. I'm delighted to be joined today by my esteemed panelists here with me, Dr. Mina Borini, Director of OECD's Center for Wellbeing, Inclusion, Sustainability, and Equal Opportunity, Pietro Bertazzi, Global Director for Policy, Engagement, and External Affairs at CDP, and Stefan Niccolo, Managing Director of Full Cycle. Before I bring them into a discussion, I just want to level set and provide a little context for what we're going to be talking about here today. For TIP, uh, system level investing, which is an approach to investing that aligns investment strategy and practice with the new and unique needs, challenges, and opportunities of the 21st century, a world that is more complex and interconnected than ever before. And system level investing is the intentional consideration by investors of the bigger picture context of their investment decisions, zooming out beyond this or that investment in an enterprise or fund pose the question, what can we do as an individual investor or as a collective investment community to address the systemic risks like climate change or racism, gender discrimination and income inequality, and in turn help to foster an environment and society that promotes more, that allows more people and the planet to thrive and supporting long-term growth and returns across all asset classes. To answer this question, TIP has articulated the 10 tools of intentionality in our parlance to engender the system level change required to meet this moment to these multiple intersecting and cross compounding crises of today. I think we're going to share in the chat the 10 tools of intentionality. And one of these tools is standard setting. That's why we're here today. And on this work, we stand on the shoulders of giants like Reverend Leon Solomon, labor rights activist and contemporary of Martin Luther King Jr., who was based in Philadelphia appointed to the board of General Motors in 1971 due to the efforts of the original shareholder activist, Ralph Nader, who was calling for increased board diversity way back in the 60s. We're still fighting that fight today. But Reverend Sullivan created the Sullivan Principles in 1977 related to minimum acceptable fair labor practices, including workplace discrimination and segregation on the basis of gender or race and pay equality. These principles are explicitly about economic, social, and political justice and human rights. These standards are a direct contribution to the dismantling of apartheid. Combined with heroic activism of local leaders like Winnie Mandela, Steve Biko, from Zile Lambo, Nuka, former head of UN Women, and of course, Nelson Mandela himself. So inspired by these incredible change makers, we now turn to our panelists to share much more about what's happening in the world of global climate standard setting, the co coalitions built, who was in the room when it happened, why it matters, and how it gets applied to the real world. So Romina, We'll talk with you first about the impact management platform. Who's involved? What does it aim to achieve? And what does it signal to the market? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, uh, indeed, I think, you know, the point on uh, intentionality and the fact that we have to make all an effort to understand what are the impacts that uh, companies and investors are producing. It's, it's core to uh, the objective of the impact management platform. This is a collaborative. This is a group of 16 global standard setters that came together already two years ago to start working on those concepts and try to understand how we can uh, define uh, coherent standards across the globe, across the world, that looks at the externalities that uh, the corporates are uh, producing on people and planet, uh, with the idea that people and planet are the two most important uh, sort of imperatives that we should all consider. And what this uh, platform is doing and achieving, in fact, has been achieving over the last two years is actually foster convergence, uh, actually shaping a common language. Uh, there are many standards, uh, there are many standard sectors, already 16, as I mentioned, but uh, each of them has a number of tools and frameworks. And the whole idea is obviously to bring them together in a way that is fully articulated and sort of mutually sort of consistent. Uh, this year and the world, we saw the emergence of major sort of initiatives uh, related to disclosure in particular, so mandatory disclosure. This is, of course, very, very important. We saw the announcement uh, in uh, Glasgow uh, around, of course, uh, the work of uh, the IFR, IFRS and uh, ISSB. These are all very clear, uh, clearly, I mean, uh, 
into what we're trying to achieve, but the point uh, on impact goes well beyond disclosure. Disclosure, in a way, is the end point, is the end destination, but uh, the process of impact starts well before, so we need to actually embed that upstream uh, in the way companies and investors are thinking about, again, the effects and consequences they are having uh, on uh, people's our planet. So this is the, the, the single objective of, of this platform, is to ensure that we are actually coordinating any sort of dialogue uh, why it is important that those actors in particular uh, are doing this job together at the table of this platform. Uh, we see uh, uh, multilaterals, of course, the OECD that I represent, uh, and in fact, that is co-chairing the impact management platform is an illustration of that, but there is also UNDP, there is the World Bank, and many other. And of course, uh, this uh, standard sectors, in fact, have a major role to play when it comes to bringing uh, to this table the policymakers. So here we're talking about alignment, uh, alignment we're talking about coordination, we're talking about collaboration across the investors, across the corporates, across the industries, but also uh, between uh, governments and the private sector. And for us, this is quite key and particularly what we're trying to do in uh, the OECD to actually develop uh, approaches uh, that are uh, the same across the different actors and sectors. And uh, the final uh, piece of information I wanted to highlight here is the fact that because, of course, this remains sort of a, a very, very sort of evolving landscape, uh, we have to be uh, doing this in a very dynamic way. A lot of the approaches that we're taking in this initiative is one where we are bringing together existing knowledge in a clear way. You know, we published a website where we are, in fact, uh, portraying this uh, this knowledge and, and again, sort of giving it, um, you know, at a glance and in a way that makes sense globally. Uh, but we are also working to to, to actually address the gaps and to look at some boxes and you know we're trying to sort of the, uh, encourage sort of the investors and the many others uh, that were working with us to actually go with sort of pilots with experiments uh, because this is uh, sort of something that is still emerging as a science and so you know we are very committed to obviously push this forward in a very collaborative manner but also with this very much sort of experimental mindset that is needed the main point the collaboration uh, we are uh, sustaining and, and underpinning here is one that of course is signaling to the market that uh, the time has come to act and you know to really act for impact. Uh, impact is no longer a niche. Is impact the way we see it is going to be mainstream and therefore the markets obviously need to be given a, a very clear direction in terms of where this is all going and in the OECD and the others partners within the IMP very much uh, you know committed to actually give that very important steer at, at a critical point in time. Thank you for that, Romina. And uh, Pietro, maybe we'll go to you next. And just under the context of the scale of our climate challenge and the gap between rhetoric and reality, the need for transparency and disclosures and reporting has only increased in importance. So we need to know what we're doing matters. How will this platform support organizations with that effort? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Monique, and uh, hi everybody. Uh, in, you know, in the in the past, you know, in the past few years, I will say we've been hearing many complaints uh, within the market and among policymakers about how difficult it is to uh, navigate the uh, sustainability disclosure reporting landscape, making sense of how the many tools, frameworks, standards um, that are available actually meet the needs of companies and investors and policymakers. And, you know, I can tell you, it's not getting any simpler. You know, Romina alluded to the, um, to the, to the, um, the steep increase of mandatory reporting policy regimes around the world that it, from one side can bring more coherence. But on the other side, I think, you know, we will still experience that once the policymakers will set the bar high, a certain high, there will be still space to improve. So I won't be expecting less new initiatives. And I think it's, it's great, but we need to create, you know, co coherence and we need to create you know some convergence of what is the uh, level playing field right so the uh, we, we felt this urgency of building this coherent and complete system of principal standards and guidance to improve at the end you know as Romina was saying it's not about disclosure it's about what is the ultimate impact that companies can have right so this is the reason why we came together within the impact management um, project first and now we created a platform that was designed to help investors and companies to navigate this reporting landscape and ultimately uh, improve sustainability impacts. It combines you know um, the guidance, the standards, the frameworks as well as sectors best practices 
and you know this is for free. It's all in one place. Uh, for example, you know companies that are looking to way to report their inputs can you know go on the platform and I can see what are the tools available, and I can go either you know looking at the GRS standards for some standards or look at the CDP disclosure platform to disclose the, the, their their information in a, in, a, in a structured way. So it's one place where you know it's a starting point, so to say. I think you know the the platform is bringing more clarity. Um, it creates more coherence of the uh, complex sustainability disclosure um, uh, reporting system, and hopefully will pave the way to advance more alignment. Well, we do hope so. And from a practical application perspective, Stefan, what do you make of these and other voluntary efforts? Um, and what ways do you meet these standards and exceed the standards in your own work as the, the applied part of the professional and as the in your in your work at full cycle. And do you use other tools to evaluate performance and impact? And what else might you hope to see in this evolving landscape for impact measurement and management? Yeah, it's it's such a worthy um, discussion we're having now, especially at this moment in time. You know, I come to this as an investor, right? So I think about not only the most effective and efficacious way for us to deploy capital, but I think about it in the dimension of time. Right. And so really understanding, you know, as a collective, uh, Pietro talked a lot about kind of the coherence and alignment that we need to have across industries and within, you know, I think about um, the scaling crisis and the diminishing time we've got to really address it. And what it points to for me is the importance specifically of prioritization. Right. So we are we are now in a place where we've got to um, be very highly prioritized in where we deploy capital and more importantly, how we measure and account for the effectiveness of our capital deployment into technology solutions, into infrastructure, into initiatives and find a way to make sure that folks are on the same page around that prioritization. Right, so that we're not solving problem 56 before we're solving problems one, two, and three um, as, as time diminishes. And so, you know, for Full Cycle, we, we uh, are investors both in technology companies and in their infrastructure projects. And because the nature of our investments are primarily real assets, it gives us uh, an opportunity to, it gave us an opportunity to devise and measure that would allow us to look apples to apples across many different kinds of technologies, specifically at how effective they are and, and we're being at abating, drawing down or averting the most harmful greenhouse gases. And so we had to kind of go internal, kind of find a measure that would take a look at methane, nitrous oxide, refrigerants, CO2, and be able to be consistent enough to look at a carbon capture system, a waste to value system, or a circularity uh, technology all the same and give us a well-ordered way of identifying where we should be deploying capital for the highest kind of effect. And so our measure uh, was called CRI, is called CROI 20, the carbon return on investment uh, on a 20-year basis. And the reason we focused on 20 years is specifically because in that first two decades, the impact of a gas like methane uh, is 81 times to 250 times more heat trapping than CO2. So we needed first to get an accurate snapshot. And I think that's the other, the other piece I would say here is, and that's, uh, that I think uh, broadens out uh, more widely than just uh, greenhouse gases and really just in climate, is that what's the time frame will dictate an accurate picture of what the problem is, right? Most of the data we're looking at today as it pertains to climate is on a hundred year basis, including the IPCC's most recent report, right? And so we don't even have an accurate snapshot of what the problem is and how, how, and, and how the contributing factors uh, in the global economy are vectoring into the problem of warming in our, in our uh, climate. And so we had to kind of peel that back and go back to data um, that was on a 20 year basis. I think what I, you know, the latter part of your question is kind of, you know, what we'd like to see going forward. And so, you know, the early part of our analysis was to build that measure internally to make us better investors, better fiduciaries, better stewards of capital. And what we realized is that actually, this is a measure that will allow for that alignment and that kind of coherence across an industry of investors looking at different kinds of assets and indeed different kinds of asset classes. And so um, we're working within some of the organizations that we're a part of. Uh, GFANS, the IIGCC, and others to roll out this measure um, to help folks align across their portfolios 
and really help us identify when investors are putting capital to work effectively, when investors are kind of paying lip service to climate, but actually aren't doing the work, right? It's, it becomes a piece of accountability as well. And I think we need that. We need that to keep everyone honest and on track to do the work that is so important for us to get accomplished. It's so important, this idea of coalition building and socializing what's working. And Romina, when we think about what's how long we've, how far we've come on the environmental side, and we talk openly about climate change now, and it makes the mainstream financial press in a way that would have been unthinkable when I was coming out of undergrad in the 90s. Uh, even when I was coming out of business school in 2005, it wasn't on the agenda the way it is today. Um, it was, climate change was maybe a dirty word when I was on the commodities derivatives desk, but progress has been made. But there's obviously, of course, so much more work to be done. But what are the S of S of ESG? You know, social issues championed by Reverend Sullivan 50 years ago have not seen the attention and the gotten the momentum from the global financial community in the same way. Can you reflect, Romina, a little bit on why that is and what might be happening to move the needle on that aspect? No, yeah, absolutely. I think we, we're all sort of you know impressed by the progress that's been made so on the E of this agenda. But uh, the problem is that you know you can't really make any serious progress on the E if you at the same time you also don't look at the S because anything you are I mean anything you're doing on the E in fact is going to have an impact on the S. And so you know investors I think have, have to they, they they know that and they understand very well you know all the investments they are going to make and like the investments as well. You know, they are going to sort of shift the jobs away. They are going to create new skills, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, the the the, the social impacts of uh, moving to uh, carbon neutral economy is going to be huge. You know, we, we have been documenting that at the OECD in terms of the number of jobs uh, that this is going to uh, create, but also, you know, the transformations that that makes in terms of the geographies, in terms of the community. So we can't... Uh, sort of overlook at it, and we shouldn't certainly take those things sort of in isolation, which is, I think, one of the risks that we see at the moment. And this is all obviously uh, uh, in, uh, I would say, takes place or unfolds in the broader context of the SDGs. We are in the decade for action or of action. Uh, we only have, I mean, le actually less than 10 years to, to reach the targets, to reach the goals, and, uh, and many of those are obviously very much uh, socially centered. One of the Arguments I hear sometimes is, you know, the problem with, with social is that uh, this is not science-based, okay? And so, you know, there is no sort of hard science telling us uh, what are sort of the thresholds, you know, what are the people boundaries, just to sort of paraphrase the, the, the word sort of planet boundaries. But actually, this is obviously not uh, correct because we have a lot of data, a lot of indicators uh, that tell us precisely uh, what are the S uh, impacts uh, that companies are making and to what extent the investors can actually appreciate those impacts and can possibly, you know, uh, uh, really redirect funds in a way that actually support the achievement of those social objectives. So we do have evidence. Uh, what uh, we are lacking at the moment is perhaps sort of the exact codes and the exact methodologies, again, that sort of create this shared understanding of this as challenges, uh, because at the moment we're still, you know, working on, on many different, or I would say, or taking different approaches to it. Uh, in the Y Center, we have developed a methodology uh, actually that defines the S impacts. It starts from our well-being framework, which was developed for governments. So that's really how, you know, we can achieve uh, people's well-being. So how we can possibly, you know, target S when we are making a uh, efforts uh, to improve uh, businesses' solutions. And we are framing that in the context, I mean, or essentially as the inputs that companies are making on their uh, consumers, uh, on their uh, employees and workers at large, on their suppliers and on the community. So, you know, the framework is very simple, very straightforward. There, there is a very specific way to unpack the S. Uh, we are adding to that data. So we are populating with indicators and those indicators are cost-effective because these are based on a sort of huge literature review that actually takes and distills the best of those indicators. So those tools, uh, you know, will be able to power, I think, convergence in those notions. Uh, and many jurisdictions right now are working on related concepts uh, in closing. Let me just uh, um, uh, refer to uh, the social taxonomy, uh, which is a piece of work that uh, Europe and the Commission is working on, on at the moment. And and try again also to, to create sort of a, a shared language uh, on those issues and be able, obviously, to map uh, all uh, sort of investments activities uh, within Europe in a way that, again, is socially responsible. 
fully agree. And you know, that's why we go on and on at tip about system level investing and why I go on and my on and on in my personal life about justice and putting those two together and centering how we think is something that Stefan and I talk a lot about. You know, we know each other outside of this panel. Uh, Stefan, do you care to wear on in this one as well? Because I think um, some of the conversations we've had about infrastructure justice really directly relate to what Romina was just talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's such so important, right? Like we we deploy capital into communities. And that has to mean something around the impacts, the unintended consequences and the second order consequences that happen by virtue of building and operating real assets in the community. I think the, the beauty of this moment actually is that we have an opportunity to deploy and to invest in alignment with both reconstruction repair and regeneration and what we need to do to issue our next, to go to our next steps forward uh, in, in, in our society and for humanity. And there's so much to be done in that overlap that we have a real uh, opportunity and it would be a shame to waste it to go out and actually rebuild. You know, this administration calls it building back better. Um, I think others around the world will call it different, will have different nomenclature, but the common theme here is that we can repair whilst we also move forward. And we, we can do so with, with uh, communities and justice centered at the heart of what we're actually doing and why we're doing it and in whose service we are doing it. And that's good, that's good work, right? We should, we should endeavor to do that um, because it allows us to kind of solve a lot of problems that would otherwise go unresolved. And if we allowed capital to flow in the same ways that got us here, we would exacerbate and recreate a lot of the problems that we created getting here. We would exacerbate inequality. We would exacerbate, uh, you know, health issues that waterfall out from building infrastructure where it shouldn't be near communities that uh, need to thrive and not have particulate matter in their air. Right? We shouldn't be able to predict childhood asthma uh, by zip code, but we can. Right? And so now that we know that problem, now that we've said these things, we can't unsay them. We can't unlearn them. And so as we make decisions as leaders, as, as folks in, in industry, as folks who are investors, like these now have to weigh in to the decisions that we make. As Romina said so eloquently, you can't have the E without the S. We build in communities. And I think the, the G is really important too here, right? To hold folks to account and have governance models that really make us um, align around what it is the work needs to be done, what work needs to be done, and in whose service we are actually doing it. Um, it's a remarkable opportunity, right? I choose to see it that way, that we get to go out and be eyes up around what it is we're solving for and to put capital into that in a way that not only repairs the past, but allows us to look forward to a more equitable and just future. And certainly we know that governments around the world are thinking about this post-COVID recovery and what of policy, the regulatory environment, the barriers that enable or actually potentially impede progress. Pietro, I know you're our resident policy expert and one of the our um, attendees also asked, you know, how do we get regulatory impacts beyond just carbon emissions? You know, where do you sit on that? And what do you see happening that maybe makes you hopeful? Or where are the areas that we need to double down as a global community to kind of release some of these uh, naughty, thorny problems? You know, first of all, full disclosure, uh, as a background, I'm a human rights lawyer. So I'm working now on climate on environment, but you know, my background, you know, my heart is on social issues. And I think it was uh, Kumi Naidu uh, that recently in a blog uh, mentioned that, yeah, the climate crisis is actually a human crisis. Uh, the world will survive to the climate crisis. Human beings may not, literally. Um, uh, so I, I think that indeed, you know, uh, going to, you, to your question, where policy sits on this. Um, the, uh, the, the work done under the, the SDGs has been amazing because it's been bringing together different agendas. Uh, still, the uh, climate agenda goes on a parallel track. So what I'm really uh, hopeful is that the, uh, you know, this is a bit of a long term, so this might be a bit, a bit of a bureaucrat uh, answer, but um, the post-2030 development agenda, so whatever will happen after the SDGs, hopefully we'll see a convergence of the climate agenda and the sustainable development agenda be more than what happened until now. Now SDG 13 is the SDG on climate, right? But still, you know, the uh, the, um, the 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 systems the, uh, the the people negotiating are different people and uh, you know the, the the gang that gathers at the uh, climate cop is substantially different from the gang that gathers for the level political forum on the SDGs 
great to see uh, the social movements uh, have been really shouting on the social just on the climate justice part. Indeed, you know the the, the just transition is part of the Paris Agreement. So it, there are elements in the current policy framework, but they're not really spelled out. And I'm afraid that this has an impact on the behavior of the markets, of the companies, of the investors. So hopefully the long, the long run, um, the end game will be to bring you know, those agendas more together. Uh, it is happening with a COVID um, uh, build back or build forward better. Um, uh, it is happening uh, somehow within the, uh, the um, sustainable development agendas that have more climate elements in, but still now the market looks much more climate than human rights. So I think we still need to, uh, to create that, that behavioral change, keep raising the issue, but indeed, you know, really putting more energies in converging the global agendas of climate and post-2030 development agenda. Thank you for that. And in the handful of minutes that we have left together, I'd love to just hear from each of you in a sort of a lightning round Twitter length comment about, um, you know, these are daunting challenges. Getting together, working for years together with all of these disparate organizations with competing structures and ways of work and, and the ways that they show up in the world. Where's your sense for hope? Because uh, you know the opposite could also be possible. We have major challenges, major crises to solve. It's daunting and perhaps leads some to despair. But I think all of you are working hard because you're hopeful and you tell us why. Romina will go to you first. Pietro's next. Uh, we'll go to Pietro next, and then Stefan to close us out, and then I think we'll be at time. Uh, well, I, I think the you know the sense of the hope from my perspective is is the fact that we're having this conversation today, and I, I maybe I have to reflect back. I, I've been in similar conversations like that, like uh, over the last few, a few months. So uh, I think those conversations, you know, are not just happening, you know, incidentally. They are now becoming sort of systematic, structural needed and every time we have one more we actually learn something we build something new and again i'm going to talk about the imp platform because this is going to be a sort of a major space for hosting and coordinating those conversations so we fully believe that uh, these are the type of instruments that that we need and we need of course alliances of actors we need to have private and public work hand in hand uh, on, on on this agenda together, of course, with citizens and civil society. So, you know, those efforts all need to be extremely sort of all of society and, and very, very comprehensive, again, bringing and, and sort of putting uh, the well-being of people uh, at the center of any effort. Thank you, Pietro. Oh, just, you know, thinking about it, um, I believe, you know, three elements of hope. First one, youth. Thanks to them, you know, those topics have been put on the agenda and hopefully soon they will start voting. So they, they will change the way that the governments will represent their interests. The second one is accountability. It's, it's critical. And now with, with the radical transparency that we live in, there will be more and more accountability. At COP, there were many initiatives being launched. And I was like, you know, okay, what about the one that was launched last time, right? <laughs> so I think, you know, accountability is critical there. And I have hope because with all the, the transparency that we live in, there will be more accountability. And the third one is very opportunistic. Financial stability depends clearly on the stability, on the, on the, on, on, taking environment and social considerations part of the equation. So I'm hopeful that the, um, uh, the, uh, the how you say, the, uh, the, the banks and the, the, the financial system will take this more in consideration because it's a matter of survival. Like that great commercial that came out not too long ago, don't choose extinction. Stefan, yeah. you have the final word. Wonderful. Um, well, I'll share two things and second everything that Romina and Pietro have excellently and perfectly stated. Um, the first is post COP26, post Glasgow. I know there were some disappointments, but 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 zooming out, we have a just barely sufficient framework to now identify what our work is, right? And we have a year to go out and do it. And more importantly, there is a superhero cast of characters um, that are doing it. And the last thing I'll share with everyone is kind of generally our best years ahead, the human story as we know it, our chapters to come have not yet been written, right? And we have efficacy to do that. And so I'm hopeful for that. Well, thank you, Romina, Pietro, Stefan, and all of you for joining us this morning. It's been a pleasure to be on screen with you all. And please stay tuned for your next session on exploring the role of carbon offsets. Thank you again. <laughs>